and the opioid education groups. Um, so that's really what, what started the idea of me putting together a play about it as a community outreach event. From there, uh, Bobby and I connected, and um, then it turned into now this documentary. So that was, that was the emphasis. And I have a follow-up question, but I think we know from tonight and from the response, uh, how has the film's feedback been? I know, I know it's been out for a little bit now, and how has it been? It's been tremendous. Um, I'm hearing a lot of, to learn that a lot of people were um, moved about the parts about poverty, didn't know, didn't really know about the link between substance use and poverty. So seeing that kind of come together and showing the connection of that, um, uh, and just this intentional project, right? This project is super intentional about inner city black and brown. And so people are, are expressing that they're thankful that we have a film that focuses on our communities very specifically. So, yeah. um, and anything new and exciting happening in your life? Because I know everyone was really happy to watch the show tonight. Any, are you working on anything or anything happening? Yes. So I, during this project, I was so inspired by doing the interviews, doing the research, um, that I decided to, I was going to pursue getting an MFA in screenwriting, because I'm a creative person, right? Like, I love theater and film, film. that's my lane, it's always been my lane. Um, but I decided to pivot and focus on community health and prevention science. So I'm currently in a graduate program. Um, so I'm running my master's in community health and prevention science. And then I'll get a certificate in screenwriting, so I can get that part done too. <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna have one last question for now. Uh, what impact do you feel this film will have and what was your intended purpose when you rolled silent to the streets? Honestly, just awareness. This is a prevention tool. I'm hoping that especially young people, you know, will have an opportunity to see this. Um, and really anybody, any age, will have an opportunity to see this, feel educated, feel like they know more about it, and have more understanding about it, understand the social determinants of health, looking at things more holistically as opposed to just like one isolated thing. Um, and, you know, just be able to just raise awareness overall. Well, great, and thank you. Thank you for doing, doing the movie. We really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, uh, if you want to pass the microphone this way, we have uh, two folks here from New England High Intensity Drug Trafficking Agency. Uh, it's Robert Lawler and Anna Kaczynski. Um, and I'll, we'll, we can go back and forth with the microphone between you two. Um, again, what, what are some of the new challenges you're facing today? This, this movie is a couple of years old, and uh, we know that the fentanyl crisis got worse. Um, and what are some new challenges? So I, I don't know if there's actually any new challenges at this moment. They're, they're kind of been the same challenges we've had for a couple of years now. And I just think it's, you know, the volatility of fentanyl, the deadliness of fentanyl, and the fact that you know, if you when you look at the results of the testing, Anna and myself see from like law enforcement seizure data, community drug testing data, you know, Office of Chief Medical Examiner data, biosurveillance data from DPH. You just look at how many um, actually active substances are in the illicit drug environment and how volatile it is in the combination of poly drug use by people who use substances along with poly substances in the drugs they're using um, is really the real challenge I think out there because um, you know the the problem is is like every every time you take a different drug whether you're taking one max hold or one twist corner or one pill the amount of fentanyl in that one thing is completely different from bag to bag to bag to pill to pill to twist corner to twist corner. So there is no consistency along the illicit drug environment. So if you have an opioid dependency and you need to take three wax full, three wax full to not go into withdrawals and um, to settle yourself, well, each of those three, every time you use three wax folds, they're going to be totally different amounts of that and all in there. And that's what really causes a lot of our issues here in Connecticut. 
Thank you for that answer. Um, oh. So we, we know you don't have a crystal ball, or do you? Right? We, we, we always try to predict the future, and it seems like our future hasn't been going in the right direction with Fed. But in, in these next two upcoming years, specifically, do you, where do you see the Fed home prices heading? Is it something that we're, we're gaining on, or is it something that you're fearful of? No, I think, you know, I mean, I think everybody in this audience and everybody who works in this space needs a round of applause because, fortunately, Connecticut's down about 14% fatal overdoses over the last two years. So I think it's a testament to the amount of work that's being done out there. Um, The awareness that you know we're putting out there about fentanyl and overdoses and addiction and substance use, the flooding the, the streets with naloxone everywhere we can, um, and just trying to take we have a long way to go, but we have taken a little bit of the stigma away, and I think that's led us to this point. And we just need to keep on going in the direction we're going. Uh, this one's for Anna, but uh, Anna, I'm sorry. Okay. Which is Anna? <laughs> it, either. It, no, it's Anna. It's, it's, it's Anna. Anna. Is it Anna? Yeah. All right, Anna, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so, so from the law enforcement perspective, uh, if you had a singular message to relate to the people in this theater, uh, what would it be? I'm going to pass that to Bobby because I'm not law enforcement. Oh, you're not? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I said the name wrong. <laughs> uh, so, so the question is, uh, from a law enforcement perspective, if you had a singular message to relate to the people in this theater, uh, what would it be? And I'm sure there's no one single message, maybe, but there may be. No, there is no one single message. I would say keep on fighting the good fight. Keep on doing what you're doing. Keep on getting the message out there. And just, you know, try and make a difference. I think, you know, I was over there with Officer Nolan and some of the people that were in the film and they're just saying that, trying to make a difference every day. And I think that's really the message, try and make a difference every day. Because like I said, we're, I, I think being down 14%, while it's not perfect, it's not to sneeze at either, because you're talking about real lives. So being down 14% fatal overdoses over the last two years means there's, you know, more people alive than not. That's a good point. We, we host a lot of different events and sometimes we have more panelists than we have people. Uh, but it's the one or two people that showed up that needed the help that night and, and, and to your point. Uh, so last question, you can feel this one. Uh, what areas do you think feel the most effective in combating the crisis and helping those struggling with opioids? Um, so sort of, as Bobby said, being that we are down about 14% fatal overdoses. Um, something that kind of gets just done a really good job of is doing some of those evidence-based practices. So, you know, we really attribute the lower number of fatal overdoses to the extreme infiltration of naloxone distribution, right? We have flooded our communities with naloxone, which we know saves people's lives, and without saving someone's life, they don't have a chance to, um, you know, go into, either treatment or um, you know find their pathway to recovery. So I think that's been really our hardest, uh, I guess, that tactic or strategy in Connecticut. The other one too, I'm gonna say, is connection. Um, linkage to care has been really successful for um, those that do seek um, treatment or you know going into recovery. So linkage, we've seen connection do the warm handoff models. We've seen so many different versions of it post overdose outreach. I think those have been extremely important and helpful. Um, and then lastly, I'm just going to say is I think something that we are still on the cusp of or can do a little bit better is talking about trauma, talking about getting um, mental health services, getting. Um, you know, getting those diagnoses of co-occurring disorders, I think that would be really, um, would help us get even more people to not turn to substances, but also to get into recovery. Great, and uh, I'm gonna ask you to hand the mic to your right. You can hold on to that one, I think. We'll just keep going that way after, because we are gonna have a Q and A Q&A after, so uh, please do stay. Uh, this is the star of the show, put your hands together. This is Donnie, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, 
Donnie, thank you for your work. And thank you for, for, for volunteering. Uh, can you talk a little about what, what your feelings are uh, on this film and what it means to you? Well, first things first, man. Um, all glory be to God for me to be in this position.
So my main thing is, is obtaining the, all the resources possible to help the, all the members of my community. Because everybody is just trying to find a way to live a better life just for today. We don't know what they expect to tomorrow. But, you know, we're here not to dictate what they want or tell them what they want. We're here to listen to whatever they want and try to help them in their way. And then this question probably is going to answer itself. <laughs> what would make your job easier? And resources, well, I know, comes well, up a lot, but that's usually what would make my job easier with the collaborations of agencies. job easier. Um, it's going to always be challenging, but we are built to challenge, to meet the challenge. Um, we have eight, you know, um, eight organizations here at CHC, the Community Health Center. We have good, yeah, we have good people there that keep us intact. I got to keep my mental health intact, too. I mean, I'm getting, don't sing them up here. That's, there's some stuff going on with me, too. I always do this. <laughs> it's always some stuff, man, but you know what? Supervision helps for me, too, because I need to be sure that I stay around here. You know what I mean? And be, and be prepared. So that's what it comes to all the agencies that collaborate with one another and just make it for the greater good. All right, we're going to pass that mic right over to the end. We have uh, Mike, who is with Reliance Out, but he's also a, a board member of Community Speaks Out. Mike's uh, been a real like, all star for us in a lot of different ways that Community Speaks Out. Uh, we do, yes, we definitely have to talk about I just want to let you guys know that there is going to be time for Q&A as soon as Mike finishes up. There's two mics located right here in front of the aisle. So if there's a question that you have or you want to formulate one, I'm just giving you a little time. Mike can be long-winded. I'm kidding. Mm -hmm. I'm kidding. So I'm giving you time to think about a question. He's my buddy. He's my brother. Mike, uh, what, what, what is your role in the recovery community? Besides everything, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know what it is today. I think um, now I think you kind of touched on it a little bit. Uh, I'm the recruiting unit director at, uh, at Reliance Health, and um, you know, so I'm also a board member uh, in Community Speaks Out for about the last year and a half. Uh, it's kind of makes me like a dual threat here today. So, um, but as far as uh, my role at Reliance Health, uh, that is part of the, one of the uh, units that I that I oversee is our recovery coach unit which um, is an outreach, primarily an outreach program to where we are able to go out into the, into the community and quite literally meet people where they're at, you know, where they are in the recovery or where they are physically, you know. And, you know, I, I have one recovery coach, honestly, that literally pulls people out of the woods and, and takes them, you know, to, to get their, you know, to get onto, um, you know, medicated assisted treatment, to go get their doses, to, to get into detox, to go to, you know, to go to treatment. And um, I have a team of, of three recovery coaches that are just amazing. Um, that um, some of you might know, Indiana, Ray, and, and Autumn, they're, they're amazing people. And um, the, the things that they do, and I, and I think we've heard a lot of stuff today about collaboration, um, it's not just one agency that does things like that. And I'll tell you what, Eastern Connecticut has a lot of collaboration. Um, you won the county last year, it was in 2022, there were 125 overdose deaths in, um, in London County. In 2023, there were 71. Okay, so that's a huge, huge amount. And that is directly um, impacted by the collaboration that, that we have as a, you know, as a, a county here in London. Um, there's a lot of collaboration. There are there, um, opioid task force in Norwich and in London. Um, and as well as um, we have a recovery coach collaborative meeting every month at, at St. Vincent de Paul, um, where community recovery coaches actually get together and talk about best practices, what's going on, what are we seeing, you know, what's working, what's not working. You know, do we have somebody that works better with another another recovery coach, you know, or another agency? Because um, I really don't care who helps the person. I really don't. It could be our agency, it could be your agency, it could be this agency. If they work better with you, I'm more than happy with that, you know? I think one of the things that we say a lot is I'd rather have overlaps instead of gaps, you know? And unfortunately, there are a lot of gaps that still need to be filled, but, um, you know, it's not a competition. It's not. You know, there's plenty of work for everybody, that's for sure. So.
<laughs> Thanks for that answer, Mike. So, uh, law enforcement, all but, uh, it, it, you could see it in this movie, it became basically a punchline, uh, a joke of how we approached it, I think, in the 80s, uh, being all enforcement side and not really getting the, in, into, the, into the recovery side. Well, how important is the relationship between what you do and law enforcement now uh, that, that's, that's made a difference? Uh, it's, it's a huge part of what we do. Um, thankfully, uh, in Eastern Connecticut, there's some very forward-thinking um, law enforcement departments. Um, it, putting my reliance up on hat on for a second, we, um, we've done a lot of work with the Norwich Police Department over the last four or five years, uh, where if somebody survives an overdose in Norwich, we, um, we go out and follow up uh, with a member of the community policing unit to go out and, um, and just talk, have a conversation with them. You know, and um, it's been a really great partnership, and it's it's helped us to reach um, a demographic or a population that we don't normally reach. You know, people that are actually housed, people that have um, you know employment, people that have um, families, to where it hasn't quite gotten you know to the point where they're starting to lose things um, a lot here. So it's allowed us to reach out to to a different um, demographic that we haven't hit before, and that's just one piece. Um, you know, it took a lot of forward thinking on the, the Norwich Police Department's, um, you know, on their part. And, uh, I mean, last year we trained the entire department on Narcan training, which Ooh. is amazing. And they carry Narcan in their cars now. Um, putting the community speaks out hat back on. We've had a lot of, a lot of great collaboration with, uh, with the Rock Town Police Department. Um, I think Tim, you know, we're talking about it, and, and I guess, it's been about nine years that the relationship has gone on now. They were one of the first, um, they actually were the first assignment from the PARI program, which um, was talked about earlier. Um, and uh, we are actually, we've done a lot of collaboration with them and they're very, very forward thinking. They have a chief that, at, at, um, at the top that really kind of drives the bus on that as well. And <clears throat> we, we really have some exciting stuff coming up with them that I can't really talk about just yet, but we're really looking forward to that collaboration. Um, there's also a good relationship with the Grot City Police Department where I know um, Tammy and Linda have a good relationship with a few officers over there that we can definitely consult with. So it makes a big difference when you can count on, on your law enforcement. So. I know as, as, as the community speaks out, we can tell you uh, the, the affiliation that we got with the police officers turned it from being a bunch of parents who were afraid that we're just maybe talking about nothing. And when somebody in, in a position of authority and power with a badge that was running police departments that saw a need to treat it differently, started treating it differently, it changed. It changed the way hospitals looked at it. And once, once the police got involved, we, we were forever thankful for that switch and uh, in them look, reaching out to us. Uh, Mike, this seems loaded, but what are some obstacles you may have experienced or are currently experiencing uh, in, your, in your role right now? Well, I'll tell you, um, Donnie touched on a lot of them. One of the biggest ones, I think, is transportation. You know, um, it, it's so hard. The number one thing that I always hear for people, um, it's it's getting from one place to another. You know, and, and that that's always been a, a big obstacle for that. But um, truly, uh, for for us, it's just all of the things that have been talked about here. You know, um, we try to uh, tr we try to meet as many people as we can where they're at, and unfortunately, we you know have a, a small team, and unfortunately, we can't. You know, meet everybody. Um, but it, it, the part, one of the parts that's, that's tough on that is, is the resources around us are completely tied to the funding and the resources that are available. And um, the film talked about nonprofits being the, you know, the backbone of the urban communities, and it's, and it's really true. I mean, no organization knows a community better than a nonprofit that's in that community. You know, and. and I have that twofold here. I, community speaks out is brought and brought this community speaks out. You know, when you think of some uh, recovery organization in, in Brought, you think of community speaks out uh, because of the you know the mission and the role that, that, that we do here. And in Rwanda itself, we've been in Norwich and serving Eastern Connecticut for 46 or 48 years, I'm sure what it is now. Um, and it's it's really tied to that, you know, and it's like unfortunately there's this misconception out there that um, nonprofits can do more with less, which really just means that you can do more with the same, or you know, try to do more with the same without. You know, what it really means is that you're going to burn your people out pretty quick. That's what's going to happen. So, 
Um, there were always those obstacles, um, the obstacles of just trying to, to meet people where they're at. And, you know, and every time staff changes or, you know, something like that changes, there's that ripple effect that comes from it. You know, I mean, somebody gets a promotion at the police department, now we have to wait three or four months, you know, to get somebody new on there. So it's, you know, there's, it's a great thing for that for them, but it's tough, you know, for the community, things like that. So. All right, last question for Mike, and then again, if anybody has a question, you can work your way up. It would be uh, the same as the last uh, speaker. What, what would make your job easier? Money? Funding. Funding. Yeah. Okay. Funding would make my job a lot easier. It would make I think it would make all of our jobs a lot easier. Um, I will say that I'm you know, very grateful for um, some of the progress we have made um, with the state, you know, with the state of Connecticut, with the legislature. Um, they seem to start to be coming around. You see that, um, you know, nonprofits need to be funded, and um, it, unfortunately, it's been flat funding for about the last 20 years. So it's like it's just starting to catch up now. Um, but the problem with it is, is like uh, for programs that actually work with substance use and you know substance use disorder, and you get out and you work with people recovery, where you're doing, you know, this work, unfortunately, there's not funding for it. I mean, an, an example, I just talked about, you know, New London County um, going from 125 to 71 overdose deaths. Norwich, we went from 30, 34 to 18, you know, in, in the same time period. And yet, I can't find funding for it. How much sense does that make? I know, we can only do what we, we can do, right? I mean, sort of one of the things that's been set up here is we've been saturating the area with, um, you know, with Narcan. Um, I've been accused of being the Oprah of Narcan in Norwich. So. In fact, if you all look under your seats, I take the one under your seats. <laughs> I, 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 one of these times I'm actually gonna do that. Though, so. There is Narcan available out there. But, uh, but yeah, um, so what we do, what we can do for sure. All right, at this time, is there anyone that has a question that would like to, oh, we have a question from this gentleman right here, and just speaking to the mic and whoever, are you addressing it to anyone in particular? Or? Just generally, I mean. A really, really powerful event, you know. I, I lived in, a, I worked on Massacast Cast for six years in the Boston area, you know. I was going to nursing school, you know. And then I moved to Somerville, Mass, Davis Square, Mass. It's crazy, you know. The addiction spiked around there, you know, between, you know, Harvard and, and uh, you know, at Tufts University, I, I actually I spoke out and spoke up, and I got a retaliatory eviction. I ended up in in West Lebanon, you know, evicted by my landlord in that neighborhood. But the addiction went crazy in Boston; it did not go down. So hands off, you know. Uh, congratulations, everybody, for doing a great job in Connecticut. My question is, like, you know, I'm trying to make connections with immigrants. Now I'm up in West Lebanon, and they definitely don't see this thing through a race lens the way they need to. So hats, you know. My heart goes out and my, you know, support, and I'm fighting that fight up there. It'd be great to get y'all up there, you know? Father-daughter couple, speak up, you know, come up to, you know, Dartmouth College or, you know, Dartmouth Hitchcock and speak there if you haven't. I'd love to do that, you know, and, and make that happen. And let's put race on the table because, you know, up there, people, the attitude isn't quite as enlightened, let's just say, you know? I drove down here. But my question is, like, dealing with language, you know? I work with immigrants, too. There's a lot of anti-immigrant stuff going on there, in addition to race stuff, Claremont, New Hampshire. It's not a good message up there. So, but specifically here, how you deal with the immigrant piece, the language piece, I haven't speak Spanish. You know, I lived in LA from when I was like in the 20s, but if you don't learn Spanish, you're not gonna make many friends. Or, you know, French Creole, so that's a question. You know, how do you deal with the immigrant issue and the language issue when you've got, you know, definitely probably those languages. Spanish is important, outreach, you got all this immigrant fear. Big, big questions, but you know, you guys have stats that I don't think Massachusetts has those stats. You know, so hats off, you know. Our hearts out to y'all, but how do you deal with the outrage if you're dealing with Haitians or, you know, immigrants? Complicated. I guess I can, I, I can uh, touch on that one a little bit. Um, well, we do have um, some resources at, um, you know, within my agency uh, to where um, that, that do um, have, that are bilingual and um, in Spanish as well as in the, the Creole. If we do run across um, an individual that we don't you know, match up with, we do have a language line that we can call and we actually get an interpreter on there. It's really kind of a neat experience. I've had to use it a couple of times and it's kind of a neat experience. I was like, oh, that's kind of great. Um, a lot of times, though, um, somebody that has their, if there's a language barrier there, they will bring a, um, an interpreter with them. So, uh, thanks for the question. Language is definitely a uh, 
by agency, they're becoming more forward with more bilingual and reaching to other, because language matters. And one thing about it, when you know, you're dealing with the communities and the substance use disorder and mental health, it's a language that needs to be respected, needs to be addressed when it comes to stigma, things of that nature. So yeah, different, um, you know, different nationalities with language can be a barrier but when you dealing with the community and its mental health and its substance use, there's a language in itself that people understand. And if you can address them with the respect and the dignity that they deserve, they can get the help that they need because it comes down to trust. That's a great answer. But before I actually call on you to ask the question, I do want to point out this is uh, the mayor of Grime, Connecticut, that was instrumental and, and directing funds from the opiate settlement, uh, the, the whole entire amount, to Community Speaks Out. And these are exactly the type of legislators that we, we want to reach out to. They say uh, all politics is local. What happens in your community is always local. Uh, Madam Mayor, please ask your question and thank you for Community Speaks Out. Sorry, I came out here because I wanted to ask and that's why I'm here to tell everybody in the audience, your town has received money. You need to write to your local town council, your city council, and ask them to give this money to the organizations within your town that help the people the most. And tell them do not use this for their budget. Do not put it in there for a clerk position or a new truck. You tell them that you want it in the right places. I see it in the newspaper, I know what's going on, I'm following it. So Grind has been supportive, and every community should be this supportive. So you, as residents of your community, should be telling your local town council to do the same. So I hear you need funding, and there was more funding, and I'm glad, and I'm very proud that Grind has stepped up to help you. Well, we're proud of you, Mayor, thank you very much. So thank you. I just wanted to, to comment on that. Thank you. And lots and lots of thank you to, to, uh, to Groton for understanding where that the funding needs to go for that. You know, um, you heard Joe uh, to talk about it a little bit, and I think, in the, the trailer ahead of time there. Um, one of the goals that Community Speaks Out has is to put a, uh, a community, uh, a recovery community hub in Groton. And it's a place where people in recovery can go to do some of the, the normalized activities that they did, you know, um, before um, they, they struggled, you know? Because a lot of times we hear that, and it's like, you know, where's a place where I can go play pool? Where's a place where I can go play ping pong or darts, you know? Usually the only places you can do that is in a bar. So that's one of those things that that, that funding can yeah. go to and help out, you know, a safe place for somebody to go and hang out and, and be, you know, have just a, a normal, good time Without having to worry about you know getting hired or, or trying to I gotta call you out, Mike. You forgot karaoke. We do karaoke. <laughs> Filipino, we gotta hear karaoke. That's right. <laughs> Joe, is, Joe is the master of karaoke. Yeah. Uh, a question? Hi, yes. I wanted to first of all thank you for the film. Uh, my name is Diane Santos. I lost my 26 year old son on December 30th of 2023, about three and a half months ago. Uh, he was fighting an opioid addiction, and we were actively trying to find resources for him. Unfortunately, uh, we met with a lot of obstacles. There was no clear path, uh, although he wanted badly to um, recover. He wanted a chance, and um, unfortunately, that path, as I say, was not Clear. His name, my son, was Mark Andrew Collins, and I'm saying it because I use my social media platforms to speak his name um, because it's so important to me. Um, and so I just wanted to um, thank um, Emotional. Um, I just wanted to say th that as someone, as a parent who uh, was kind of blindsided, um, we had nine days from the day that he told his dad and I that he was battling an opioid addiction. December 21st is the day that he told us, although we knew for some time that there was a problem. We didn't know specifically what the problem was. And we tried during that time frame to find him help. Uh, December 28th, 
I, out of frustration because we could not find him resources, brought him to our local emergency room. I don't know if I mentioned, I'm from Norwich, born and raised. Um, so we brought him to our emergency room where he did not receive help, where he was sent home with a phone number. Um, and 36 hours from the time we left that emergency room was the time that I found my son unresponsive in his room along with my 15-year-old granddaughter, who was the child of my oldest son. Mm -hmm. And so we live now with the image of my baby, mm -hmm. who was cold on the floor. And I'm not trying to be graphic, but I'm trying to be real to express what is happening, you know? And, and I commend all the work that's being done. Um, I have familiarized myself with the spreadsheets that are located on the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner here in Connecticut. Um, I actually um, accessed my son's toxicology results prior to them calling me because I was aware that the Excel spreadsheet was available on their website. And I located a 26-year-old black male who died on December 30th at home in Norwich, and it listed the chemicals, the substances that were in his body, which were a total of five fentanyl being at the top. Okay, so I guess, um, I don't know that I really have a specific question so much as an observation that um, I don't know across the state of Connecticut um, if there is uh, our hospitals that in the emergency room, which is the first point of care and such a critical step for people who are in crisis, I don't know if there is, is, is I, I mean, there's Hartford Healthcare, there's Yale, which kind of divided up the state. Um, I don't know, maybe Lawrence Memorial has a more active program for treating active addiction. People who come in, my son came in willingly. He was 5'11", 200 pounds. I could not have carried him into that emergency room. He went there because he wanted help, mm -hmm. help that he did not get. Um, and sadly, like I say, it was only 36 hours later that his life ended. Um, so I would hope, and this is my life's mission and purpose now as a mother, because I'm his voice now, um, is to really emphasize to the state of Connecticut hospitals that the emergency room is a vital point of care. And when someone comes in willingly, and asks you for help, the time to help them is right then. Yeah. It's not to give them a phone number. Yeah. But it's a small of time with which to get the help that he needed. You know, and, and we could have, we, I could be telling, I could not even be standing here right now because my child could have gotten the chance that he wanted to have. And, and um, I guess I, I don't really, I just, I, I just try to use my voice to bring awareness, and while I have these few moments in front of everyone, I do want to um, acknowledge the Eastern Connecticut Violent Crimes Task Force, who was so swift and so efficient in apprehending the person who my son obtained this lethal dose from. Um, so there is great work being done in the community. I want to commend the Norwich Police Department as well. Groton and Town Police and Norwich Police that work together on this task force. Um, but I just want to make everybody in this room aware, in case you are not, that you would think the emergency room is the place you go to, that they're going to help you. And my son, he didn't get that help, and that could have made the difference between life and death for him. So I guess I don't really have a straight question except to thank all of you. Sharice, thank you so much for the film. I only found out about tonight's event earlier this afternoon and I immediately got tickets for my granddaughter and I um, because as I said, my life's purpose is now to advocate uh, for my son because his voice can no longer be heard, but, but it can through me, so thank you. Yeah, yeah.
I will say this to make sure if you do have that loss, to point out the young ones in the family because they're feeling that loss every bit as much as we are. We often forget that. Mm -hmm. um, sir, question? Yes. Uh, my question is, uh, my passion is with the children. And my question is, is, when is it too soon to implement programs within the school system on the elementary level, middle school level, and high school level, where this is, you know, substance abuse and mental health is part of the curriculum? like math and English and everything mm -hmm. else. When do we target the kids? Mm -hmm. So, it is never too early, <laughs> number one. And it's a complicated question because it's similar to the funding issue. You know, when we look at our school systems, we have so many, um, you know, curriculums in place, right? English, math, grammar, science, those are kind of those core components. And unfortunately, health and substance use education is at the bottom of the list sometimes. Um, you know, I think that to kind of go on to the other end of, you know, when we as adults talk to young people, also realizing that it's also not too young to have a conversation around substances as young as three, four, five years old, because there's safe ways to have those conversations, right? Just like we would tell, um, you know, a toddler don't take candy from a stranger, we can do the same thing when it comes to um, drugs or, or pills or any other substance. Um, so definitely there's age appropriate conversation starters to have. Um, and I think that, yeah, I mean, it's never too early, but I think that's something else that we need to advocate is that our school systems, you know, yes, they're overwhelmed. They're also dealing with a lot of um, mental health issues with students, right? So early identification of mental health issues is really another piece that, you know, our school districts and our school, our education system needs to look at is to fund positions to be able to be able to have those early identifiers because that's really gonna be, that's going to be the difference between someone trying a substance and becoming addicted. And, you know, the other thing, too, I'm just going to add with young people, um, you know, we kind of see the far end of it, right? We see the addiction piece. We see, you know, people that are struggling, people that, you know, are using fentanyl. And, you know, when it comes to young people, there's so much time to intervene. And that's what's really important. And we need to intervene because from you know, five, six years old till 18, 20, there's a, there's a lot of years that we can do some sort of intervention. So, um, hope that answer your question. Yeah, thanks. You know, I just remember when I was a child, the D.A.R.E. program, you know, yeah. you would come in and that had an impact. I still remember it, you know, so, you know. Yeah, and there's a lot of evidence-based curriculums. Um, it's just, I think, you know, having staff and then also the timing and carving out time to be able to um, infiltrate that into the school system. Because I agree with you, I think it should start as young as kindergarten or first grade. Thank you for that question. Good question. Uh, Ma'am? Hi, I have two questions. I was wondering, for one, how do I get involved with all of the community? I know you guys are like different groups and stuff, but when you get involved with that, and my second one, would you guys be willing to come back to different recovery houses and sober houses to speak to, to the whole entire quarantine groups and stuff like that? So, um, the great thing about Community Speaks Out is it's about mostly volunteer work. We're a completely volunteer working board, and we rely heavily on volunteers. So, um, there's a board member sitting right to your right here that can probably give you a little information or catch one of us after the after the uh, the event here. But we'd love to have you know the more the merrier as far as the volunteers go. And the, the great thing is that we do go out and talk to to sober homes and sober houses. Um, one of our outreach efforts with Community Speaks Out is with sober homes. So, yeah. And this this is the last question of the night. We we uh, are on a, on a tight schedule here, but uh, go ahead. Yes, I'm Donnie. I'm one of the navigators in the you know, Southeast region, and I work out of an agency called Alliance for Living. And yes, we um, we have some members here that you that you can receive the cards from, and you know we would love to. Just one of our key things would not just um, be in service to people, but to educate. That's one of our key things, and you know, for our communities to educate our community, mm -hmm. and even with our young people, each one teach one. You know what I mean? 
and so the small houses I do have a, a passion for because I didn't last time you learned. <laughs> it was behaviors, but maybe if I was told about certain things, I probably wouldn't be doing certain things. But you know what I mean, so feel free to um, we have some cards, you know what I mean, and, and the support of some agencies that's here. So they would love to collaborate with you and to give you the information you need. And we'd love to come out. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, I think there's about 12 or 13 tables out there where we could walk up to and they, they would all take your help. Um, I, I just want to point out that when we first started this group, uh, my wife and I went to one of the meetings that was close to our house. So 75 people struggling in the, in the, the disease of addiction. Uh, we went because my son brought it to us. Uh, and I remember going there and seeing two of my former players, along with 75 of my members of our community, suffering so close to our house and not realizing it. And so boldly saying that don't worry, the Calvary's here. Like I call myself the Christopher Columbus of addiction because I found something that was already a problem a long time before I got there. And I thought I was going to be able to fix it in six, five or six months, maybe at the max. Um, it's a lot bigger problem than that. Uh, I tell everyone, don't be the Christopher Columbus. Come to things like this. Make sure that you're showing up. Uh, the, the way the Calvary's always been there. It's just a matter of talking to each other. I think the movie kept referencing between law enforcement, between all these agencies. Uh, we keep speaking to each other. We keep reaching out to, to, the, to, the, to each other. And we thank you for putting on this movie. We thank this board. Community Speaks Out thanks you all for coming tonight. Uh, and have a great night and get involved. Thank you.